Father, we love you. We love you. We love you. We love you. Holy Spirit, we pray that you will come right now as you have manifested your presence in this place already. And that through the preaching of your word that you will heal. That you will heal. Jesus, you have come to preach, to teach, and to heal. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you. We worship you. Keep that song throughout the whole sermon. Come on, if this is your first time here, welcome. It's great to have you with us this morning. Welcome. On behalf of Pastor Ad and Pastor Nareta, welcome to CRC Uppington. It's been a fantastic harvest event in Kimberley. Oh, come on. And uh, just fix the sound. It's really bad. I can't hear myself here. It's too ringing over there. Just fix it, please. It's not warm. Of a kind of leer stadium break. I don't need a leer stadium break. I'm not full as a bit. Thank you. So, this morning, um, I must say that we got extremely good report of the people that went there to go and minister. So, thank you to all the ushers. Thank you to all the counselors. Thank you to all the kids' church workers. Thank you for every department, media, all of you. You all did fantastic. You all did phenomenal. So really, really, Pastor Brian said, and Pastor Ad asked us, me and my wife, to say thank you, appreciation to everybody from Uppington that went there, that sacrificed, that sacrificed to take off, to go there, the finances, to be able to go there, and to go serve. So Pastor Ad said, please, say for your means, a donkey, I've seen eight of the court. Okay? That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. Amen. So, so uh, one day less than 60 days, you know, last night I laid there and I said, Lord Jesus, for a budget of uh, 600,000, that means it's 10,000 rand a day for the next 60 days. So guess what your pastor is going to do? <laughs> Challenge people wherever I go. Okay. So don't ask me, what can I do for you? Do not pass to when I can you say 10,000 rand. <laughs> Amen. Come on, come on. Now listen, as I said last time, the Lord has spoken to me that I have to challenge businesses, not business people in their personal capacity, but businesses. Because to, to, to partner with a vision and a mission like this, you will have a fantastic impact in your business. Okay, it doesn't make sense, but what with God does make sense in any case. Okay, nothing that he ever did makes sense. Nothing that he tells us makes sense. I mean, die for people that hate you. What does, what's the sense about that? Walk on water. What sense is there in that? Forgive those who despitefully use you. Do good to those that are your enemies. I mean, nothing makes sense when it comes to God. So when it comes to speak to you about money, it's not going to make sense at all. But you just do in obedience. Because everything is about obedience. So I'm challenging business people, 30 business people. So uh, last week when I challenged the uh, Monday already, a businessman that's not even from here called me and he said, Pastor, 20,000 in the account because the Lord spoken to me. So, um, but that's one. 29 to go. 29 to go. So there are people that are sitting in this place and I'm not, it's not under compulsion. But when God speaks, do. Don't even hesitate. Don't even think twice. Because when it comes to things like this, you will always try to reason God out of it. Believe me, I've been through this so many times in my life. Every time God says, listen, you've got to do, then I sit and I reason, 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 reason. I remember I had a collection of old money. Now, uh, that was my Isaac. I worshiped that thing. And I still remember when I was in Rhema, I went to Rhema for a conference and one of the preachers stood up, and as he stood up, he started speaking. He didn't even talk about money. And while he was talking, the next moment, the Lord said, Isaac, you've got to sacrifice Isaac. I said, Lord, what do you mean? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> you know how we can be? And he said, that collection of yours, worth hundreds of thousands, because it's a full collection, signed by the right people. I said, Jesus, please don't touch that. He's like, I want it. I said, but Lord, nobody's going to appreciate it. He says, I'm going to appreciate it because you don't give it to men, even though they receive it, I receive it. 
I take it. So you give it to me. I said, Jesus, please, I'm never going to be able to get that collection again. And um, the Lord challenged me. He said, what do you love more? Do you love me more? I thought, Lord, but they're not going to appreciate it. They're not, not going to understand how much value there is in. And then <laughs> the next day, guess what the Lord wants? So I came with my whole collection, sat with it on my lap, a lot of tears, a lot of uh, 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 going through emotions. And I said, Jesus, take it. I gave it to the usher. The usher looked at it like, what's this? I opened it up. I said, take it. Just please. He said, don't worry. We'll take care of it. And they took it. And I sat there and I thought, what now? <laughs> that was my Isaac. Okay. Long story short, I said, I've got another collection. Okay. Because God is faithful. He will not take something and not give it back. But He speaks to us in places that we don't want to do certain things. He will always talk to you. And the one thing that we learn, I see now some of our men have gone through hell for all the time that I But the thing is, the Lord speaks and you obey. Sacrifice is not sacrifice if it doesn't hurt. So when it hurts, it's a sacrifice. <laughs> it doesn't come easy. I mean, fantastic praise and worship, by the way, this morning. I, it's, you know... Uh, it's it's amazing that you know you walk in as a pastor and you minister and the anointing is there for the people but it's very seldom that something happens like what happened this morning to me when I get a personal encounter with the Holy Spirit while being in worship and having to lead you which means you guys have done your job today I will not say the first time you did it so come on, let's give it up for the band. They are growing. They are maturing and they are growing. Hallelujah. That's what matters. It's like watching your kids grow up in front of your eyes. It's nothing more satisfying than that. Amen. So, well, before you stand here for the rest of the morning, you can take your seat. Welcome this morning. We're going to get into the last part of prepare for harvest. All right. So as I said, Today, 59 days left. Excitement is there. Please, people don't just come by themselves. People don't just come because we are praying. People don't just come because God brings them. People come because of relationship. People come because we bring them. Okay, so each one of us have a huge, huge, huge responsibility to bring people to the harvest. Okay, so, and listen, I know it's much more difficult to get a person to come to church than it is to take them to an event. Because Uppington's people love events. A new church there, people rush. A new event there, people rush. I mean, look at our events that we've had. Every event that we've had, we've just filled up this place. So I don't doubt a little bit that God's going to fill up that place, but it still takes work. I mean, every event that we've had in this hall, the hall was too small. We had to take other halls. We had to go to Dana Felt, and then we filled up that hall with the women's conference. So people in Uppington loves events. Don't think well, it's going to be difficult. No, if you think it's going to be difficult, it's going to be difficult for you. But to get people to come to the stadium for a massive event like that, everybody's watching, they're seeing what we are doing. And the nice thing about this is that it's building up. I mean, look how big Kimberley was. Now the next one is Cape Town. It's Dream Week, Cape Town, and then Uppington. So uh, come on. It is our responsibility to fill up every seat, every space. You know, I would rather have a problem with space than what I would have a problem with having too big a sound system and empty chairs. Okay, so let's fill it up. Let's fill it up. Let's fill it up. Everybody on board. All hands on deck. So some of you have got massive, massive, massive impact in people's lives. People, business people. Um, use your relationships for God's glory. Now before I get ahead of myself, let's get into the Word. And let's talk about this one thing. That is so important. <clears throat> so last week we spoke about the fact that we have to sow for our harvest and you have to name your harvest. I've got so many good testimonies just in this week of people that have spoken to me about last week's sermon. I think it was one of the tougher sermons to preach. When I w walked off here, I said to Pastor Nathan, Yeah, I must have worked today. Okay, 
But it's usually when you work that hard that you start to hear the results. And I've heard the results in people's lives that people said to me, Pastor, honestly, I didn't realize. Or maybe, Pastor, I've done this. Some of you have been challenged because suddenly God said so. And now you have to name that seed. And <laughs> suddenly you felt like I had to give away my Isaac. Okay, but when you are obedient and loving God, then you will do what He asks you to do. And you will see the result because God is faithful. He is always faithful. And even if you are still waiting, He is still faithful. God will come through for you as long as you don't quit. Okay, don't quit on that harvest. Don't quit on the seed that you have sown. All right, sometimes you see seed grow faster and sometimes it feels like you have to dig it up to see what's happening. Okay, then you just leave it. You just leave it. And you trust the Lord because it's a principle and it shall come to pass. Amen. So we have spoken about sowing seed and how important it is, our tithes and sowing. Not just giving the tithe because the tithe meet the needs, which means God will meet your needs. My God shall supply all your needs. But you want to get to a place where the Lord is not just your need supplier, but He becomes not just Jehovah Jireh, the provider, but He becomes the Lord your shepherd. Because the Bible says, He is my shepherd, I shall have no want. You don't want to live in a need-based life where God just need meet your needs. You want to live in a place where you are the little sheep on His lap where He just don't just supply your needs, but He leads you beside still waters, where He feeds you at green pastures, and that you have no want. Uh, that's amazing to have a relationship with God to the place that when you say, God, I want this, He gives it to you. And you're like, but I don't even need it. It's okay. You want it because you're my sheep. You're my child. I want to give it to you. When you walk past the ice cream stall, there at the expo last weekend. What will happen? Your child is like, I want an ice cream. What do you want? An ice cream. What do you do? You buy an ice cream because they want one. Okay? They don't need it, but they want it. So you give it to them. And that's the kind of relationship that we have to have with God that even if we say, Lord, it's my desire. It's my desire. I want. The Lord says, delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires the wants of your heart. The key is your relationship with God. The key is how close are you with Him. The key is how obedient you are towards Him. Because when He loves you, because He does unconditionally. This morning I thought about it, how we as people, we reward people on conditions. If you do well, I will tell you I love you. If you don't do well, I will either ignore you or I will gossip about you. Okay, so we are performance based. We, we, um, uh, the performance of the person determines what level of love we give them. So our love is conditional. I love you if I want to. I don't feel like loving you today, so stay away from me. Okay, and we are, everything is on a rewards basis. If you do things good, then you get something. And it's the same thing with giving. How do we teach our children? Do we give to our children unconditional or do we use it as a method of reward? Like, Pastor, <laughs> you're challenging me. Yes, I know. Because everything about God, God doesn't give you because you deserve anything. God gives it because He loves you. Unconditional. Sometimes, like this morning, the presence of God comes upon you, and you're there overwhelmed, and you're like, but God, I don't even deserve this in this moment. And then the Holy Spirit is like, but I still love you. You know, it's like that time that I went to go... Um, it's a funny story, but I have to tell it so that you understand. So, so every now and then I go away just to get time with God alone. And then sometimes all the stress and all the work causes me not to go as often as I want to. So, so I had this desire. I just wanted to be alone with God again. And I was in the ministry working, working with this before I got married. And then the next moment I said, well, I'm going to go to my favorite spot in the Northern Cape. I'm going to spend time with God. And I planned everything and I was on my way. And as I wanted to leave, my phone rang. And somebody said to me, listen, a friend of mine, he said, listen, the Lord told me to bless you with something. I said, okay, can it wait? Because I want to go to be with God now. He said, no, 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 where are you? I said, no, I'm at my, we're still in the farm in Grudering. I said, I'm going to go. He says, well, okay, I tell you what. Meet me in Camus. 
I'm like in Camus. Okay. So I went to Camus and I stopped there and I met him there. And he looked at me and said, listen, I booked you the night here. I said, maar ek wil nou daar achter die duin loop slaap waar ek by die heren kan wees. Vir wat wil jy nou my nou, and, and I discovered the guest house that I've never seen in my life. It was so good at that stage. It was like five star plus plus. I'm telling you, it was just phenomenal. And I walked in there and yes, it felt funny. Because I walked in there and there was this bath with foam in it and candles and every, I said, hey, I'm not a woman here. What's going on here? So I started looking at my friend funny. Like, what got he on? He said, no, but the Lord instructed me. Now, he was from Joba. He drove all the way here and he prepared everything. And he said, the Lord told me to come and do this for you because you deserve it. Because the Lord wants to romance you today. I'm like, whoo, this is out of my comfort. And that night, and he left. He went back to Joba that evening. And I spent the night there and I was laying in that bath and I'm thinking, Jesus, I wanted to go suffer now by fasting, not eating. Now I've got a big meal. I wanted to go sleep there behind the, the bushes so that I can suffer to get into your presence because I was in performance mode. I've got to do to get. Okay, and then I was laying in that bath and the Lord said to me the following. I'll never forget it. It was one of the clearest moments of my life that the Lord spoke to me. He said, Jacques, I just couldn't wait anymore for you to come and visit me. So I just had to spoil it. I, I, I said, wow. So I enjoyed that evening thoroughly because I felt the presence of God in that place and the Lord told me how much he loved me. And then I still went and I went to pray. But it was a whole different thing for the rest of my life after that. Every time that I separate myself to go I, I, I can feel how excited God is when I choose to be in His presence. It's like, you came to visit me. You came to worship me. You came to be with me. And that, that, that eagerness, because it's like, not just me in love with Him, but He is in love with me. I mean, think about it. That He's in love with you. It's difficult for us guys to understand this. The ladies get it. They're all like, Oh, I can see how look for my dude. But the guys are like, yeah, man. Well, God calls you his bride. He wants you in that place of rest, of peace. He wants you in that place of intimacy. He wants you to receive as well, not always to give. It's a relationship. It's called relationship, which means both ways, not just one way. Too much of our Christian lives are based on one-way communication. God forgive me, God forgive me, God give me, God give me, God give me. I only pray forgive me until I feel forgiven and then I start to ask. Give me, give me, give me, give me. Okay, and God's not like that. God's like, no, walk with me, man. Walk with me, talk with me. In the garden, walk with me. Come on, Adam, come on, let's walk together. So he comes and he's looking for Adam. Adam, where are you? I've been waiting for you. I've been excited to spend time with you. Why are you hiding? What's causing you to hide your own stuff? Your stuff that is so important, your agenda, your things, everything that you have to do is so important. And all I want is just to be with you. What is this that you have done? It's like, it's not me, it's the woman. Woman, what have you done? Well, it's not me, it's the snake. And we know the snake didn't have a leg to stand on. And then it came back. Judgment, judgment, judgment. Not because God wanted to, but that was what's re what was required in the Old Testament. So the love that God has for you is a, is a relational. And there's a reason why I lay this foundation because of where I want to get to in the sermon today. So your harvest is to reap what you have sown. It's as simple as that. What have I sown? That's what I get. The time that I've spent is the time that I will get. The time that what, what, what I've given is what I will get. Okay, God, you don't give a car and then you expect a house. No, you gave a car, you're going to get a car. That's it. You're not going to give a car and then near the earth, so it's on us here near. God will give you what you sow. Because God is not a man. And God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, he shall reap. So what you have sown, you can expect the harvest. The duration of the harvest, the time of the harvest, should not even bother you. You should wait patiently. Because those who endure to the end shall be saved. 
Amen. You should trust God enough to know that at the right time, you know what I've learned with God? He doesn't always give me what I want when I want it. But He definitely gives me what I want when I need it. Not always when I think I need it. (laughs) So there's a big difference. So God will give you because He's faithful. Amen. So you need to learn to recognize your harvest. That's where I want to end off today with this series. Recognizing your harvest. How do I recognize my harvest? Because last week you have realized when you, had, when you sowed certain things, you kind of walked this week and you realized, hey, that's my harvest. I've sowed for this. Hey, that's my harvest. Hey, but that's my harvest. I've sowed for these things. Now you name your harvest. Now you will receive your harvest because that's how God is. Amen. Now the question is, this question now is, how do I recognize the harvest that I've sown? And this is very, 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 very important. What I teach you today is most probably the most important thing when it comes to your financial increase, when it comes to your, your, your blessing, and when it comes to God wanting to get stuff to you, not just because of riches, but because of relationship. Okay, so listen this morning. Most people miss the key ingredient of every harvest. What is the key ingredient of every harvest? It is called relationship. Relationship. So today I want to talk to you about the harvest of relationships. Because your relationships is the basis and the key to unlock every harvest that you need. All the finances you need, all the blessing, all the increase, all the prosperity you need, it all comes from this one thing, relationship. And it's not just your relationship with God. That's where it starts. But God wants you to have a relationship with other people. No man was born as an island on himself. No ministry should operate as an island to themselves. There should always be relationship. When we talk about a building, you've got two bricks beneath you, you've got two bricks on the side of you, and you have two bricks on top of you. Why? Because you have to support those that are above you. You have to relate with those that are with you. And that you have to rely on those that are under that are that are your leaders actually that keeps you up. You see, when we look at leadership, we think the leader is on the top and everything else goes to the bottom. No, that's what the world sees with leadership like. But when you build leadership, you build it like Jesus built the church. The chief cornerstone is Jesus Christ Himself, and everything else is built upon Him. So it's Jesus, then it's the apostles, the doctrines of the apostles and the apostles. Then it's the church fathers, then it's the desert fathers, then it is the the, the next level church leaders. And every level of leadership is built upon and what we are, are on top. We are the guys that's most probably going to keep the roof up. But we, because we're on the top, we think we deserve all the glory. And meantime, we have to rely on all the support. The relationships that has got you where you are. You see, in this world, we are in a place where we use and abuse relationships to get somewhere. I am in the church until I get my break and then I go. I've had people like that so many times. Business people coming here, down, busted, disgusted. Things are just bad. And then the next moment, we pray, pray, breakthrough. We pray, pray, pray. And then God gives them breakthrough. And the next moment, in one day, things change I've had people coming to me and the one moment they were still broke and then God blessed them with an amazing breakthrough. And the next day they come to me and they say, well, pastor, now that we're going to be great givers in this church, we want some things to change. I'm thinking when you were busted and disgusted, it was good enough for you. But now that you have money, now you want to come and change things. If it wasn't good enough for you when it was bad with you, then it will never be good enough for you, even if you have all the money in the world. And guess what? Those people are no longer with us. Why? Because they break relationship. Okay? And so there are many other things. I mean, how many of my daughters have left this house because some, I don't want to say it, some dude came in here, told her how beautiful she is. I'm ticked off with this. Believe me. I'm ticked off with this. And, And I'm watching your girls. Because, Daddy, if you ain't going to tell her that that fool should go back where he comes from, I will. And I've already done a few. Most probably your daughter was too ashamed to tell you. Now she just hates the pastor. 
because I've got your telephone number and I'm going to call you. I'm going to talk about that dude that you met at the party, that dude with your fray in the achter seat of the car. That dude. I'm going to talk to you. That dude but my daughter come fat. Because I've seen too much of that. Relationships broken. Because some dude walks in there and he builds a relationship and he takes my daughter away of whom I am responsible to because you're my daughter. Whether you like it or not, you are. And the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 13 verse 17 that I am responsible and I have to give an account over every single one of you. Every single. So the question is, what does your account look like? When people call me and they ask me, we want to employ this person. They ask me, the pastor, because they know I'm going to tell them the truth. Then what am I going to tell them? Because I love you, I have to lie. No, because I love you, I have to tell them the truth. You know, I know so and so. They are in the church. What I can tell you is the following. They are fantastic at this, fantastic with this. I will always boast. Great with this, good with this, fantastic with this, fantastic with this. But where I would watch them, the weaknesses are the following. They come late. They're not always reliable. They love social media more than work. So just watch these things. Woo, cake no feel Some of you are like, is that to come back my job for credit? I think so. Because I want to recommend you to the best. But then you've got to be the best. I'm not saying you've got to be perfect. But your relationship should be most important. Your relationship with God is the most important. Your relationship with His house. People don't understand why I should have, well, the church is just a church. If I don't like this church, I go to that church. No, 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 no. You can't do that. You can't. Well, pastor, why not? Because it's relationship. The biggest way, the biggest thing, the, the biggest, what you call it, issue that causes every relationship to break is one word. Selfishness. It's about me. It's about what I can get, about where I can go, because it's about me. Are you with me? So, so, relationship is the most important thing that you can have. Your relationship with God and your relationship with one another. Your relationship with the house of God. Okay? Your first priority is God. And having God as your first priority means that His, his body is equal important because you can't decapitate Him. You know, I used to watch these things, how they put it up and... The older you get, the more you realize that these cliches are just cliches. It's not necessarily biblical. Oh, it looks great. And it preaches fantastic. But it's not always the truth. Because it robs people from the truth. And what happens is you, you, you have cliches like what people would put up as the levels of responsibility. Number one is God. Number two is your wife. Number three is your children. Number four is your job. Number five is your house. Number six is your finances. Number seven is the church. Huh? No, 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 no. You can't separate the head and his house and in his body. Jesus and the church is number one. That's it. Okay, now listen, listen, before you get a bee in your bonnet, it doesn't mean that you should overcommit yourself in the house of God. You have to still live balanced. That's what it's all about. So it's God and his people of which your wife, your children, your family, everything is important. You've got to give each one their peace. But you cannot say, well, yeah, my vrou is belangriker as die kerk. Ek en jy gaan koppen stamp. Maar pastoor, 